I'm told very confidently by those who should know that uh, we've sorted out what was happening with the microphones and that uh, the uh, feedback buzz or whatever else was happening and was in particularly interfering apparently with the feed uh, has been resolved. If it uh, plays up again, we'll uh, have people look at it again at lunchtime and see if we can solve it. I understand how important the feed is, but we're trying. Ms Orr. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I call Dennis McMahon, Chris Wheatcroft and Warren Day to give concurrent evidence. Well, uh, can we deal one at a time? Mr Wheatcroft, first, uh, would you prefer to be sworn or make an affirmation? Sworn's fine. Thank you. Just repeat that. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. McMahon, sworn or affirmation? Uh, sworn, thanks. Yes. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. McMahon. And finally, Mr. Day, would you prefer an oath or affirmation? An oath, Commissioner. Yes. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr Day. Do sit down. Yes, Ms Orr. Mr McMahon, could I start with you? Uh, your full name is Dennis McMahon. That's correct. You are a senior lawyer with Legal Aid Queensland. That's correct. Uh, and Legal Aid's head office is at 44 Herschel Street in Brisbane. Correct. And have you received a summons to attend and give evidence today, Mr McMahon? I have. Do you have that summons there? I do have. I attended that summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.1, the summons to Mr McMahon. Mr McMahon, you've made a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 19th of January to... I'm sorry, the 19th of June 2018. That's correct. And you have that statement there? That's correct. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. I attended that statement. Uh, the statement of Mr McMahon of 19 June uh, 2018, Exhibit 4.2. Before I move to the other witnesses, can I ask you a few preliminary questions, Mr McMahon? How long have you been a solicitor? I was admit admitted in 1979. And you work in the Farm and Rural Legal Services Unit at Legal Aid Queensland? That's correct. And how long have you worked in that unit? Since 2003. And could you describe for the Commission the work of the Farm and Rural Legal Services Unit? The unit uh, only deals with negotiations for farmers and rural-based businesses with their credit providers. Um, it tends to uh, negotiations and mediations. And what's your role within that unit, Mr McMahon? I'm a senior lawyer. Thank you. How many lawyers are in that unit? Two. Thank you. Uh, and how do farming clients find their way to the Farm and Rural Legal Services Unit in Queensland Legal Aid? Until the, um, the recent Act was uh, introduced, the Queensland Farm Finance Strategy had obligations in the document uh, obligating banks to encourage their customers, if they uh, consider them to be in financial difficulties, to seek professional help. Uh, that included uh, seeking help from their accountants, rural financial counsellors, solicitors. Uh, Legal Aid was part of the uh, referral process there, but we would primarily get our referrals from rural financial counsellors, sometimes from private profession and even sometimes from banks. And under the new scheme, under the compulsory scheme, under the new scheme, obligated? there's no obligation. There's nothing mentioned in the in the Act about uh, how it's referred, and uh, our uh, referrals would primarily be coming from the Rural Financial Counselling Services. Thank you. And are there conditions that a potential client has to meet before legal aid can act for them? Under the Farm and Rural Legal Service, if the client has been uh, engaged with difficulties with their banks, they would normally qualify. There's no asset or income test attaching to the process. Thank you. Uh, now. I'll ask the other panellists some questions and come back to you, Mr McMahon. Mr Wheatcroft, your name is Chris Wheatcroft? Yes. 
and you are the Chief Executive Officer of Primary Production Services Incorporated. That's correct. And your address is 111 Augusta Street in Geraldton in Western correct. Australia. Uh, now, um, Mr Wheatcroft, have you received a summons to attend and give evidence? Do you have that summons there? I have. Tender that summons, Commissioner. Give it 4.3, the summons to Mr Wheatcroft. And Mr Wheatcroft, you've made a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 15th of June 2018. I have. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? They are. Thank you. I tender that statement. Give it 4.4, the statement of uh, Mr Wheatcroft of 15 June 18. Mr Wheatcroft, Primary Production Services Incorporated, uh, the entity of which you are CEO, is the entity that runs the Western Australian Rural Financial Counselling Service? That's correct. Uh, and how long has Primary Production Services run the Western Australian Rural Financial Counselling Service? It has existed for three years, but the board that runs it has, has run it for 11 years. Thank you. And could you please explain what a rural financial counsellor does? The intention is to return people to profitability or to assist them in adjusting um, within or out of agriculture. We use a Harvard Business Planning Framework work to facilitate people's understanding of their business position. And against that, we use counselling skills to facilitate the understanding of people as to the meaning of, of the implications of, and the dissonances that exist within what they've mapped out for themselves. And are there any particular qualifications that are necessary to be a rural financial counsellor? There is a diploma of financial counselling that they need to have. And in addition, we require that they have a good understanding of the finance industry and, and banking for farmers. They have to also have a good understanding of agriculture and the various forms we deal with it. It's not just broad acre. And they need to have a propensity to be able to listen and carry out the counselling skills that are required. But they don't have true counselling qualifications in terms of a degree. And there are rural financial counselling services throughout Australia? There are. And could you explain how they are organised? I there are three state services, South Australia, Queensland, South Australia, Western Australia and Victoria at, and Tasmania. Victoria have four, New South Wales have three from memory, Queensland has two. Mm -hmm. And how are the rural financial counselling services funded? They, 90% roughly, approximately comes from the federal government and the remainder from the state government. And how many rural financial counsellors do you have in Western Australia? We have 10 at this time. And what sort of backgrounds do they have? From CPA qualifications, banking, um, farming, and you, yes, education. And you worked as a rural financial counsellor yourself? I did before. for seven years. Thank yes. you. And now that you're CEO, do you maintain any involvement with the clients? I supervise all difficult cases and have oversight of the program. And how do clients find their way to a rural financial counsellor in Western Australia? So half would be self-referred, and it's usually the um, farming partner, the wife, that refers them. Outside that, it's the stakeholders, from banks to accountants to the people that are involved and know that there's a problem in the, for the farmer. Thank you, Mr Wheatcroft. Now, could I turn to you, Mr Day? Your name is Warren Day. Yes. And you are the... Australian Securities and Investments Commission's Regional Commissioner for Victoria. Yes. And your business address is 120 Collins Street, Melbourne. Yes. Uh, Mr Day, have you received a summons to attend and give evidence? Yes, I have. You have that summons there? I do. I tender that summons. Give it 4.5, the uh, summons to Mr Day. And Mr Day, you've made a statement to the Royal Commission dated the 8th of June 2018. Yes, I have. Are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. I tender that statement, Commissioner. Exhibit 4.6, statement of Mr Day, 8 June 18. Mr Day, you're a member of the Commission's senior executive leadership team with responsibility for ASIC's assessment and intelligence group. That's correct. And the Assessment and Intelligence Group has responsibility for misconduct and breach reporting? Amongst other things, yes. And how does ASIC and how do you, in your official capacity, come into contact with farmers? Uh, it's generally through two ways. So through the Misconduct and Breach Reporting Team, which is ASIC's, in effect, National Complaints Program. Obviously, there's a large number of matters that are raised on 
various issues, including farm finance and farming issues, uh, through that channel, if you like. Um, that may also, though, include um, contacts direct to the Commission or referrals we get from parliamentarians on behalf of their constituents. And so they all come in through that group and we look at it that way. Uh, certainly in relation to some of the matters raised by parliamentarians or directly with the Commission, I might become personally involved and speak to farmers uh, in relation to the matters they've raised. The second way is through my regional commissioner work. We attend a number of events and uh, a number of uh, outreach activities across the state of Victoria. And so through that, it may be that I'll uh, speak to a number of farmers at field days or other farming expos and like events. And through that contact, you know, again, use that as a channel within which to understand the issues that are going on. And you've identified 68 complaints to ASIC in the period from the 1st of January 2008 to 19 May 2008 that were about rural, I'm sorry, 2018, that were about rural matters, farm lending or enforcement? My, my team has, yes. Yes. And much of your statements informed by analysis that your team has done of those complaints? That's correct. Thank you. All right. Now, uh, can I come back to you firstly, Mr Wheatcroft? Uh, could you explain to the Commission how important is debt finance to farmers? I'd estimate that probably 80% of agriculture relies on debt financing. Yep. And Mr McMahon, do you have any comment on that? I think debt financing is absolutely vital for agriculture, for the development and the continuation of it. And Mr McMahon, what are the types of um, facilities that are most commonly used by farmers? The normal trading account would be the overdraft, um, that is, uh, the majority of uh, farmers would have those. Uh, there's also many other various forms of um, loans that are available, and each bank has a different name for them and whatever, but um, they, they can have uh, a loan structure where there's uh, term loans tied up with interest-only loans, um, uh, short-term loans, even though they're in a, a facility that's for 20 years, yet parts of it can be drawn in early. Um, so there is a lot of a mixture of those sorts of things as well as they do even go down to credit card facilities. Um, there's, there's stock mortgages, there's um, facilities for crop, uh, crop funding, etc. And what security is usually taken uh, by banks who lend to farmers? Uh, the banks would normally take uh, uh, registered mortgage over the, the farm itself, over the land. Uh, that normally would have, um, most instances, that would in, in involve the farmhouse, uh, or it can, can be intergenerational, it could be three and four families on the one property. Uh, in addition to the landed security, they'll take security over the livestock, plant and equipment, um, some crops. Uh, they'll take personal guarantees. They'll also take um, off farm assets as, as security. They'll uh, can take um, um, mortgages off um, either the assets, for example, the partnership uh, can be uh, secured by way of a, an, an agreement with the bank. Mr Wheatcroft, do you have any further comment on the securities taken by banks in farming finance? I just mentioned to the Commission that um, regardless of whether or not the mortgage is over the home, you cannot go broke in Australia without the bank having access to it. The only benefit of not having a mortgage over a property as you go broke is you can dispose of it under your own terms. It's debatable whether you can even use the proceeds for your own purpose, but really there is little benefit in practice. Mr Day, does ASIC have a role in the regulation of farming finance? Um, I've had the um, benefit of hearing your opening this morning, Ms Orr, and effectively farm finance is in some respects a subset of small business lending and the um, Corporations Act effectively has very little coverage, if any, of uh, in relation to small business lending and farm finance, therefore. Um, the only real provisions are in relation to unfair contract terms, which are quite recent. Uh, the provisions in relation to misleading and deceptive conduct, warranties uh, and unconscionable conduct in the ASIC Act, not in the Corporations Act. Uh, and. Uh, you know, so limitations in those types of spaces is, is really what we're dealing with. 
Um, therefore, there's no need for a licence in Australia for small business lending, albeit that the major lenders who take up the you know, huge majority of loans in Australia all have licences for other respects and therefore um, you know, there are certain standards they have to meet in terms of external dispute resolution and those types of things. And in your view, should ASIC have a greater role in the regulation of farming finance? There's certainly an argument for that. Um, as I said, if you're, if you're a non-bank lender um, for farm finance, it may be that uh, you're, you know, if you have no other licence, you're not required to be a member of external dispute resolution schemes such as CIO or FOS uh, and soon to be AFCA. Uh, and therefore, you might not be able, you know, a, a borrower wouldn't be able to avail themselves of those services, whereas they can at the moment. Um, so, you know, a standard in relation to that. Uh, the other questions really are then about the sort of practices and standards of conduct required of banks in relation to their lending activities. And some of that is covered um, effectively through the Code of Conduct, Banking Code of Conduct. Some of that is also covered in relation to um, their requirement because of the other licence they have of membership uh, of the external dispute resolution scheme. So I guess the point I'm making is um, a lot of the features, if you like, of a licensing regime borrowers for small business or farming finance enjoy those things, um, but the minimum standards responsible lending those things aren't there at the moment. So there is an argument maybe that's required. Uh, Mr Wheatcroft, how do farmers in Western Australia most commonly interact with banks? Often in person. I think this is about whether people come to the farms. Usually there is a manager who will visit them. Some farmers choose to, to deal in Perth because they prefer to keep it away from their local area. And um, once you enter difficulty, you'll deal with the asset management wherever the bank ha happens to have those people located. And it is not consistent, like it may be with the same bank. Uh, one person will be dealing interstate and another within the state. Is that an answer? Yes, thank you. And Mr McMahon in Queensland, how do farmers interact with banks? Mainly in person. Uh, the Farm and Rural Legal Service mainly deals with asset management, so dealing with the bank offices uh, normally in uh, the capitals. However, uh, the clients prior to getting into asset management would normally be dealing with the local agribusiness banker and um, they, uh, you know, they're st strategically placed throughout the state. And Mr Wheatcroft, have there been many, to your observation, bank closures in rural areas of Western Australia in recent years? I think it's it's correct that most country towns, many country towns are reducing and the banks are one of the um, institutions that disappear, yes. And in Queensland, Mr McMahon? Yeah, there's similar experiences, uh, Ms Lord. The, uh, recently, uh, it was in the Queensland Country Life published there that uh, I think Ingham had its ANZ and Suncorp branches were just recently closed and the ANZ uh, branch in, in Claremont uh, was closed. Uh, it was just... An, uh, publication the last two weeks and uh, I think the same thing exists. The problem with customers in those circumstances are they've got a long way to travel to their, to their next branch. I would make the point that when people, especially if they're big, they enter difficulty, they, the best thing for them to have is a competent manager with decision making ability and understanding of their business and the issues that are affecting them. And I, I do not think that the localness of that matters. It actually is the bank having someone that can make decisions competently at that point and t in a timely fashion, because timeliness costs money if it's delayed. No matter where they are. I don't think it matters where they are. They will usually travel for one meeting about it, but for locate, no. And do I take it, Mr Wheatcroft, you're referring to the asset management phase of the engagement of a farmer with the bank rather than a loan origination phase, for example? So with free enterprise, the banks are very keen on maximising the benefit. So I think they decide whether the person needs to be local or not, and that's done in their interest. Asset management is correct. I'm referring to um, the competent person is what's needed at that time. So that's at the point when the farmer's already in trouble in default on their facilities. It's actually at the it's, difficulties in farming take a long time, years, compared to other businesses. So it's at the point where decisions need to be made. As if finance starts to be restricted because decisions that take too long to be made, the opportunities to lower your costs, to be timely in putting in the crop are lost. 
and those things cost businesses significantly. And most of the angst I experience with people that have feel they've suffered badly is because of the timeliness, because they lost the timeliness of the decision making. It lost the time between what are, what, what are the outer limits of the time that's lost? What's the point that uh, starts the time running and then you get a decision, I understand that, but what, what's the time you're referring to? When they have gone to the bank, when the bank should be uh, so at the moving? End, sorry. Go on. Can we say, at the end of a season for, yeah. for Broadacre, the farmer is then looking at funding for the following year. Yep. It's timely to have the decisions then as to how much money they have because the opportunity to purchase fertiliser to backload it at a lower cost are significant savings to a business. In my experience, as, as the bank reduces, well, as, as they <coughs> enter difficulty, the bank extends that time out almost to the start of seeding. And we will find people with a, you should be dry seeding, say, in April in the northern region, and people can still be debating with the bank in April, May as to what money they have. There is also a timeliness that in addition to that, um, we, CSIRO have developed a very good cropping model that takes the soil characteristics and water rainfall and 100 years of history, and it gives the probability of yield based against additional fertiliser, given the rain. Forecast of rain is five days out. You can look at yield profit, which is the, the model they use, and you can say, if I put yield on, if I put additional fertiliser on, it will 80% chance of increasing the yield and subsequent profit. It's a five day window. So in answer that both windows are important. Uh, Mr Wheatcroft, have you noticed any changes in the agricultural lenders that are operating within Western Australia over the last 10 years? There has been some entry exit. Yes. Who has entered and exited? In my statement, I've noted that Suncorp have come and um, reduced Landmark, Elders Finance, largely. There was a West Coast Livestock that started, and AACL has come and gone, which was um, it's almost a share. Oh, sorry. It was, had investors sharing in the production risk and the profit. And did you observe consequences for farmers in Western Australia of the entry and exit of those entities from the lending market? I did. What were they? So with Landmark, it was particularly noticeable because much of Western Australia was heading into a drought. The, it, the book changed and we couldn't find people to make decisions. And it was, uh, it was almost impossible for those farmers to have responses to their requests. And so they, yes. That was a significant difficulty for them. Um, some courts, similarly, as they've withdrawn, they've tended to move management um, to Queensland. But the difficulty there is that people aren't experienced in Western Australia. So that dissonance between what I said earlier, it doesn't matter. I don't think it would have mattered if they had people that really understood what was happening. But that's lost. Um, and. Mr McMahon, what about Queensland? Are there particular players in the market who have entered and exited in recent years? In uh, recent years, the, with the Commonwealth Bank acquisition of Bankwest, uh, Bankwest Book, um, they uh, basically stopped lending in Queensland and uh, the Bankwest customers were either migrated over or they had, no, they had to find a finance elsewhere. Um, then, of course, there was the landmark uh, a, AWB um, acquisition by uh, ANZ and uh, there, there has been uh, various name <coughs> changes and, and the like uh, with Rural Bank um, and Elders, uh, there was Elders Rural Finance for a while there and, and uh, I think it's now called Rural, uh, Rural Bank or Rural Financial Services or something like that. And what did you observe um, as the consequences of the Bank West and Landmark events that you referred to then? Well, I think it was similar to what Mr Wheatcroft has mentioned that the um, customers, um, there was a complaint about uh, not knowing who to talk to, about people, uh, there was an enormous uh, change in staff. Um, people would have a manager for a short time and then that manager would be gone. Uh, the clients really needed to have someone that understood their business and uh, as, as in Western Australia you have to have the, the funding uh, absolutely necessary at the time. Um, 
And if that wasn't available, the, the consequences for a business is it's not just that particular year with uh, farming, it can go on for several years after that. If you don't, uh, for example, with sugar, if you don't uh, give it uh, the correct uh, uh, fertiliser and sprays uh, at, at the uh, correct time, that's potentially going to affect the crop production for the next couple of years. And that, and that in turn affects not only the customer but also the bank's position as well because the, the value of the property goes down. Um, everyone, it's very easy to see the, the effects of a failure to, to manage those crops um, and all, all of the prospective buyers, if that's what ultimately happens, would see that that property isn't, hasn't uh, been managed to the correct way or to the usual format. So certainly timeliness is, is, a, is a massive issue. And Mr Day, are you aware of the relative market share of the major banks in the agricultural lending market? So the, the major banks have increased over time their share of um, rural finance lending uh, to the point now that it's in you know, the high 80s into early 90s percent of the market. Um, and you've seen over time a number of other non-bank lenders disappear from the market as well. So in the Victorian circumstance, you've seen in the past debenture offerers um, such as Southern Securities or Banks here be in the market. They're obviously for a whole range of reasons post GFC not there anymore, uh, or their activities have been taken over by others. I think Southern Securities was taken over by Bendigo Bank, um, their activities there. Um, but those other, uh, other lenders have just disappeared. And Mr Wheatcroft, who are the major agricultural lenders in Western Australia now? I'd say the four large banks, Rabo, to lesser extent Rural Bank, and in Queensland, Mr McMahon? All of those uh, institutions plus Suncorp. And uh, there are some uh, credit unions to provide some facilities. And of course, we've got the pastoral houses that provide uh, ongoing um, finance for either stock or, or crop. And there's merchant houses that may provide assistance to horticulturalists and those type of uh, people. Mr McMahon? In your view, what are the most common causes for farmers facing financial difficulty? That's a difficult question because each matter is really um, has its own set of circumstances. There are, I suppose I, when I'm looking at a file, I, I look at the original loan to see um, whether there was some alarm bells there that, and they often... Um, arise if you can see that if the if the loan was too tight at the beginning that within a short period of time there was cash flow difficulties clients are going back to the bank asking for more finance um, and that will in, perhaps be an indicator that there was insufficient funds given in the first place they weren't provided there was insufficient consideration given of cash flows um, and so the, there is that initial problem um, it, throughout the uh, the conduct of the, uh, the, the matter, if, if you see that um, uh, over a period of time the, 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 loans, the, uh, the loan is continuing to rise, that may indicate either a failing business or uh, that there's been through successive periods of drought and, and the like. Um, and then you look at, um, well, what, are, what was the, the, the cause of default and the often... Um, It'll be the overdraft being overdrawn to, to meet the interest payments on the other facilities. And, and that can be uh, uh, because of either failure for crop, failure for uh, drought, um, or just bad timing. Uh, the crop may not be, re be ready to come off. So there's um, uh, the fact that the, the facilities will fall out of order may not necessarily be an indication of the business itself but it certainly is, is grounds for the bank to um, raise some concerns about the conduct of the account. Do you think that banks do enough to take into account the seasonal nature of agriculture and the effects of weather events like droughts and floods? It's, I find that the, it's, that's a, another difficult question to answer, but the, um, if, if the client is aware that issues are going to be arising, and normally they, they, they can be, um, if they, for example, they're, um, uh, they're aware that this season has had a poor return, they can go and discuss with their bank 
um, or they should be able to go and discuss with their bank these are the concerns they have and what are we going to do for the future. Um, so the if if the concern relates to the to uh, seasonal conditions, then uh, the there should be a, an ability within the business to to um, work through the program. Uh, this is where you've got to have rural financial counsellors uh, looking at it, doing um, uh, projections, and uh, if if the clients are given early access to uh, encouragement to go and, and seek these services, a lot of the problems that arise may not um, become the acute matters that they eventually do become if without the proper assistance. Mr Day, do you have observations about um, what ASIC sees as the most common causes of financial difficulty for farmers? I, I think, as um, Mr McMahon said, it's sometimes difficult to categorise them, but I think the types of issues we see is a key person issue. So um, one of the family might become gravely ill and that distracts from the, you know, the endeavour and so that will cause um, impacts. Um, a lack of experience. Often you see people going into farming who just don't have that the level of requisite experience or you know, family history in farming and that causes issues. Obviously climate, weather, drought, um, natural um, weather events, those types of impacts. Um, changes in markets um, in terms of price because of world prices or because of other you know, changes such as um, export of cattle problems that have caused. Um, also, um, commonly, we also we have seen loan to value ratio issues been raised in the past. Um, uh, terms coming up, like the end of a, a term of a loan, and a very short to the point of insufficient a period of time and notice given to the farmer. Therefore, they can't get um, you know, arrange other finance and the problems that's caused. But we've also seen overextension or taking on too much risk. So you will occasionally see farming businesses that try to take on other. Um, investment activities such as development of property for um, housing or land or taking on other business opportunities and the farm, the income from the farm just can't support that as well. So you see a range of those types of issues. Mr Wheatcroft, can I ask you the same question? What, what do you observe about the most common causes for uh, farmers being in financial distress? Can I separate my answer out? I was born a fifth generation farmer and back then I absolutely would have said it's the environment within which you work because there are so many things when you're out there farming that just you can't know which, what the result's going to be in terms of rainfall and disease, the whole range of it. Eight years on, two, eight years of tertiary study on, my head sees things as they teach you to in terms of how you would manage those risks. <clears throat> it doesn't diminish the reality of, of the situation for the farmers going through it. The same decision made four years apart, in my experience, I have seen one business thrive and the other go broke. Because you cannot, because the impact of those following years when you have to take the risk of expanding, and virtually any Australian agricultural enterprise has had to do that to still be farming today or in the last decade. But, so those, there's a lot that isn't actually controlled by management. So yes, it is always management in one sense because how you deal with it is how you're managing it. But there are things that happen that are good decisions that end up with bad results. The difficulty I see is not so much the seasonal stuff, but when, of relevance to this commission, is when there's been an inability of the bank to respond in a timely manner. And the offence that people feel, and the sense that they are, it's not justified, what has happened to them is unjustified. In, um, if we look at Harvard's business planning framework, they say that your values are really important in terms of the business. And what's happening with, our, with agriculture, with people that, that struggle to, to accept what's going on, is something's happening that's offending their values, the core beliefs of why they farm and how they're there. And that affects their ability to adjust quickly. And there is a notion that farmers put their head in the sand, but I don't accept that. I think it's true that farmers often look to tough it out. They look to adopt what they've used previously that's been successful and they apply it again. And the systems that work actually allow them to sit there almost for too long and too much loss occurs. And once the money is lost, there is no way back. And so I, ex I think there are a lot of seasonal issues and often they are the fundamental trigger that causes problems. Yes, it is about management, but it's also about 
the, the values that people have and the way that they can be, as people, we react to, the, to offence. And you know, in an MBA, they spend a lot of time these days in teaching you how you respond. You're, the things that are hidden to you, as well as the people you're dealing with. And I think much of what rural financial counselling has to do is, is to actually facilitate the process of people coming to terms with what's going on. And sometimes it is the bank that's actually out of shape on it. But that whole process can be worked through, yes. I think I've said enough on that, Commissioner. No, you haven't. Go on. Uh, uh, you tell me that, uh, that uh, there's an offence to values. Can you blow that out a bit more and expand on that? You haven't said too much. You haven't said enough yet. Go on. <laughs> so, um, the perception in, when you're involved in agriculture, where I grew up, was that you're actually are doing something good for the world, for the country, for your community. Most of those people are supporting their communities. They're supporting each other. So it's a very integrated group. Um, Additionally, in WA, with reducing populations, often your friends aren't the people you might choose, right? So you actually, you, it's an interesting mix in country towns, isn't it? You know, in country communities, because you're working together, and in a sense, that battling, there are always ways in which things are diminishing for country people at this time. The communities are getting smaller, the shift in WA away from sheep somewhat removed people from the towns. So that's all happening, and they're focused on surviving. So if everything is fair and just, we make good decisions. Um, and it takes energy to work really hard for low returns. In, in WA, you know, in the Northern Wheat Belt, there's two decent years, two very poor years, and six moderate, break even. Sometimes there's three poor in a row. Those two good years you have to capture you have to be able to respond when they come around. And to some degree, it applies to the other areas. So the inability for those people sitting there, as their debt increases, so the banks are less likely to confirm whether or not they're going to give them money. So for their experience, they're just sitting there waiting for answers, battling for a response, ready to work, ready to go and do it. But every day goes by, they're deprived of the opportunity. And this goes on for a couple of years. Now, from the banking perspective, they have got loans out there. They know they're getting towards the risk. So in many ways, they want to actually restrict that. But if the way of restricting it is to limit the amount of money available, which is in some ways a sensible option, they can deprive the farmer of the opportunity for the additional fertiliser or more likely the additional chemical when it's needed early on to put the crop in, to control the, the, the weeds. Um, the longer that you can understand a bank waiting until it knows whether it's going to run, because <laughs> as we said, yield profit actually predicts then what the possible yield is. So for the bank, it makes great sense to hold off on that decision. Goes up the ladder, no one makes it. So from a bank's perspective, in addition to the banking perspective, you've got the local branch manager is, is paid on his portfolio. He has a reputation, but he also makes money out of it. He expands it, he can double his income. So that's one driver for him. He doesn't want a defaulting loan. He doesn't want to talk to the farm about dropping back because it's going to cost him real money. Above that, I'm uncertain in WA whether the branch performance, but I've heard in other places there are. So they're judged as a group, but certainly at the state manager level, they have to predict to the national level what, they're going to look, what their book's going to look like. The level of loan, the level of risk, likely the level of losses. And then they're held accountable to that. So in terms of how they manage it, if the season's looking to be difficult, they'll make, as I understand it, of course, it's only my understanding, but they'll make the projections and then they'll act to make them come true. So if they've said we're going to write six million off in bad debts this year, it likely will be six million. So some people might, they might act earlier with some people than they will others, and, and for some they'll delay it. So for the farmer sitting there, all of this stuff feeds into the unfairness of it. They know someone else who actually has been funded. They know someone else who's got through a year before or five years before. And so that sense of injustice about what's happening makes, it doesn't make them cry, it makes them um, want to tough it out. 
it makes them become more, re in, their work, in their minds, more resilient and more likely to try to battle the bank. And so, and that's the dynamic. And so on occasion, there is no doubt in my mind that real um, harm comes to some people from that process and businesses as an unintended consequence, actually. Mr McNown, can I ask you, um, do you regard farmers as generally being proactive in managing their finances and dealing with the bank? Yeah, very much so, yes. They, they are quite resilient and uh, they're quite aware of where, where they're at with, their, with the uh, overdrafts and the like. Um, with the, re regards to people uh, with the head in the sand, some of those people may have been through years and years of uh, drought. Uh, some of them have had to destroy all the livestock, may not have any f income for the foreseeable future. Uh, that takes quite a number of years. And uh, you know, they, I've been to properties where there's three months worth of mail sitting in the corner and a uh, person not able to open it. And uh, the bank manager would be complaining that the person isn't, um, isn't responding to uh, requests for information and the like, and uh, those people aren't, uh, they're, they're sick, they, they're suffering from depression, and uh, they need a lot of um, assistance, they, they need time to work through their problems, they, they don't really know who to go to, to discuss uh, issues like this, like you said, they're proud people, they've been trying hard, um, and we've found that uh, by giving them, um, by discussing it th with them, uh, it, there are potential avenues available for them s sometimes. Sometimes they may have no option but to exit. But th if they are exiting, at least they'll try to do it on their own terms or feel more comfortable going to the bank and discussing things. But, but they certainly, you just need to give, the banks need to give people time and, ex and understand, the people that are managing those files need to understand the trauma and distress these people are going through and, uh, and treat them, don't treat them with indifference. Mr Day, what do you see in your work in terms of mental health issues affecting farmers in situations of financial distress? Picking up um, what Mr McMahon said, I mean, often you'll see a number of years have transpired, um, you know, where the, the farmer is doing everything they can to try and hang on, do what they need to do, um, and then it does build up. And so you w the, the depression and the pressure, if you like, of not performing becomes high. Uh, there's issues of... I mean, as a small business, these are very different because the, the family home, and probably intergenerational home, is on the property. Um, they're a member of that local community. Um, the fact that they're not doing well, maybe picking up something what Mr Weecroft said, you know, compared to others is, is putting pressure on them as well. So all of those impact. So often the people who come to us who are at the very end um, and have been through probably some form of mediation or been through files or some other mechanism, um, they've reached the end of their tether, and you can see quite often that you know depression is is certainly present, um, amongst other things, and that makes it then a very difficult circumstance, you know, for the farmer to deal with, um, and the bank. I think uh, picking up again what Mr McMahon said, I mean, the banks need to appreciate that as well, and I think they are trying, but generally speaking, I don't think that they are equipped to deal with that. Similarly, they've got business decisions to make themselves, and so you've got this really difficult circumstance of. Um, personal issues, business decisions being made by the, the lender at that time, and it just becomes very difficult then for all involved. And Mr Wheatcroft, how do rural financial counsellors assist in those circumstances? If we exclude the people who, the exceptional cases, because I think that's slightly different, in the general terms, by calming the situation, by mapping out against the Harvard's business planning framework, the way to look at a business, the, the opportunities and the risks, the, um, the values and how they look at a future forwards. People calm and they clarify what it is they're trying to achieve. And at that point, they'll make good decisions. It's actually, you know, I, I reject the notion that people are actually, um, they're the poor decision makers. It's not. Many of these people make very good decisions, but the, the, um, the the effect of the stress over years has actually diminished their capacity to make good decisions, as it does all of us. We know that from psychology. There's also a large amount of antidepressants into the rural community, I know, by the pharmacy. So all of that builds into the problem of 
restricting that clear decision making. And sorry, Ms. Orr, if I just add, I mean, in terms of the people who come to us, you know, they obviously want someone to help, and they, to a certain extent, you may say they want someone to protect them. And the problem, and I'm not seeking sympathy, but the problem for ASIC is there's very little, as I said before, that we can do. What we do want to do is refer them to those services that might help put frameworks around them to help them make decisions and engage with the issues at hand. And that will be rural financial counselling, that will be personal counselling as well, that will be to farm debt mediation and those services. Now often people don't want us telling them that, they want to see something else out of what they see as the banking regulator, but the best thing for a lot of them that we can do is put them to those you know, valuable support services so that they can actually get frameworks for making better decisions around them because at that time they probably can't do that. May I flag at that? At the moment of difficulties, those it would be interesting to know how many of the cases had receiverships involved out of the ones that complained to you, because the act of putting in a receiver never benefits the client. I absolutely categorically say that. I actually think in most cases it doesn't benefit the bank, and I suspect something else occurs. The banking decision to put them in may be driven by something else. They may actually think it's the independent person that will do the right thing. I'm uncertain, but I wonder if the Commission couldn't look at the at why receivers are put in as opposed to the receivers in practice, the practice of receivership. It is, it is, there is nowhere to go once a receiver's in. And, and in terms of values, farmers will see that hard-earned um, money farm asset disappear under a receiver like you've never seen. What, they would perceive the money is absolutely wasted. And I would be hard with my background from either the farming or the business management to say that's not correct. It's a massive destruction of value. And, and that sits deeply with people from the Senate. Thank you. <laughs> They'll be better off, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think, without the commentary. Uh, let's just get on. Yep, go on, Ms. Orr. Can, can I turn now to some questions about specific acts aspects of banks' practices in relation to lending to farmers. Uh, can I start, Mr McMahon, by asking you, by the time you become involved in disputes between farmers and banks, uh, do you often see default interest having been charged on the farmers' facilities? Uh, yes, Ms. It does depend on which bank is involved. Uh, some banks tend to use uh, interest as high interest charges as a uh, as a tool in their in their um, weaponry, if we can term it like that, mm -hmm. uh, it's an encouragement for people to to um, uh, address issues. Um, I, I often see it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. When they when someone is in difficulties, the last thing they need is high interest rates, and um, so it, it certainly does depend on the bank. Some banks charge high interest rates on the whole facility if, if it's if it's got out of order. Others will charge higher rates on the part of the facility that, that's out of order. Uh, so, for example, uh, they might can continue to make payments on, on a term loan and increase the overdraft facilities, which is out, and charge the higher rates on those. It, it really depends on the matter. And what sorts of rates of default <coughs> interest have you seen? Well, I have seen rates of up to 16%. Um, but, uh, you know, most, most banks will have a... Um, a higher rate in any event for agriculture than what that would be for a normal loan. Small business loans are, attract a higher uh, rate. And um, look, it does vary from uh, not only from bank to bank, but also from uh, client matter to client matter. And do you see instances of banks using the amount of default interest that's being charged as part of the leverage to resolve a dispute with a farmer? I certainly see it with, with mediations. They'll use it as a carrot and stick approach. If you um, achieve certain milestones, we'll rebate the default rates. Um, if you uh, so that, that's a type of approach that some of them do do use. Others will say, look, we'll we'll just rebate all the interest rates from now on, and we won't charge you from uh, from a certain time when, and then and then won't charge any default rates on the facility. Uh, certainly, when they're in. Um, during a deed of forbearance, normally the facility generally should be regarded as being back in, within order. But, um, but, you know, it really depends on the particular bank. And 
Mr Wheatcroft, do you see banks charging default interest um, in clients oh, who come to you? Absolutely. Because banking, from banking mindset, the way they tell a customer that they're actually getting at risk is by increasing the interest rate. I actually think it's part of their language. So I don't think it's, it's um, yes, absolutely they do. The, um, and it makes it difficult for farmers, of course, because if you're in difficulty, the one thing you, you're trying to do is reduce your expenses. So that would be correct, as Mr McMahon has mentioned. And Mr Day, does ASIC have any views on whether or not it's appropriate for banks to charge default interest? Um, in terms of whether it's appropriate or not, I mean, that's down to the terms of the, the contract and the lending contract. But what we do see is that um, it's very difficult for, and the common complaint to us is that the borrower can't get a reconcilable statement about how the banks constructed those um, default and penalty rates in the first place. And I think then what becomes very frustrating for the borrower, certainly when they get to a mediation point or a negotiation point, is that seemingly then the default and penalty rates are changed and lowered. So there's a question about whether or not they were real in the first place anyway. And so that's that question of leverage. Is, is penalty and default rates being applied as some form of leverage point um, to get, if you, if you like, the farmer or the borrower to behave in a way that the bank does want? Um, and yet it's still surprising to us often when you know, we, the things that are shown to us that a bank which is in the business of providing statements of account seems to have problems you know, creating a defendable, reconcilable statement about what actually is owed. But I pick up the points that Mr Weecroft and Mr McMahon said as well. Could you speak of banks using default interest as leverage? Leverage to do what? It's hardly going to be, is it? to get the farmer to work harder, the farmer's working hard. So leverage to do what? If it's in, if it's in um, a process of being in a deed of forbearance to achieve um, reduction in debt or to um, sell a property. It will almost always be realise assets, won't it? Almost always, yes. Because otherwise, how's the debt going to go down? Well, um, just getting back on one of the, the past comments, I think it was Mr Weecroft was talking about um, um, when the, the property, uh, with the timeliness of providing funding and the like, if, if we've seen circumstances where uh, for, for one known reason uh, a bank has left one customer who's in similar circumstances to another uh, hasn't taken action and, and, and in that particular matter both the bank was saying to both of them look we're, we've got concerns about your viability um, and they'd actually offered both mediations and one wasn't able to proceed due to illness but there was bumper crops um, <coughs> happened over the next 12 18 months the, the fellow that the farmer that was forced into the mediation in, in, in that he's had no other option, um, he felt very, uh, felt that the, it was very unfair, him going into mediation when he had a good crop. And the irony is that they'd been through years and years of, of poor crops, the good crop, and then for the next two years, there was actually very good crops. And the farmer that was able to uh, not go into mediation and manage his affairs and, and not uh, have to be forced to sell, um, he ended up um, uh, coming out the other side very well. He um, had a very, very good uh, return for two or three years, sold uh, one property, had the other property debt free and had much money in the bank, whereas the other uh, uh, client um, has felt very much... Uh, so, uh, he's been felt, felt it was very unfair that he wasn't able to take op opportunities when for years he'd, he'd suffered through the droughts and then there was a, an opportunity to get through. Um, and they all see one another. They, you know, you could live 50 mile away from one another and they all, everyone knows everyone in the area and they see how things are progressing, so it's... Um, Mr Wheatcroft, can I ask you some questions about property valuations? Yes. Uh, for what purposes do banks use property valuations? Uh, to determine the level of um, borrowings for the, for the amount that they will lend. And security. who generally performs the valuations? An independent valuer paid for by the bank and the valuation paid for by the um, borrower and the valuation goes to the bank. And Mr McMahon, have you observed instances where property valuations have been prepared not by an external valuer 
but by one of the bank managers? Bank managers, yes. And in your view, do valuations prepared by people internal to the bank who are managing the origination of the loan pose any risks? I think the risk is that the, uh, that the valuation in inverted commas will be to assist the loan application as opposed to being what may be an accurate reflection of the value of the property. And there certainly is that risk because the manager is likely to be getting some uh, incentive out of the, the loan. Uh, now, Mr Wheatcroft, <coughs> you said that the borrower pays for the valuation, that's right? Yes. Uh, in your experience, do banks typically share the results of the valuation, the valuation report that the be, borrower has paid for with the borrower? It would be untypical for them to share it. It does happen on occasion, but it's not normal. And the response normally is that it's just the bank's valuation. And in your view, should the banks share the valuation with the customer? I wouldn't use the word should, but I would say that it would be valuable to have at the point when negotiations are occurring at the, at the end, almost before a receiver or when things are finishing. For the more understanding and clarity and transparency that is available at that point, the better in those negotiations. The more a farmer understands what the bank's thinking and why they make, how they're making their decisions, I think it's beneficial. So why not should? You, you, you said, uh, you, you stopped short of saying should. Sounded why? like I was telling someone what to do, that's all. A lot of people doing that to me <laughs> at the moment. That's <laughs> all, Gamisa. It would be very useful to have it. But uh, yes. what's your view? Is it that the bank should do it? Uh, it would be wise so for the I bank to do it? It would be better for the bank to do it? In the overall issue, I think there are times when banks carry people through. In West Australia, there's no doubt at the second year of a drought, with no sign in, inside of it breaking, that you would not want new valuations done at that moment. Properties that are put up for sale at the moment won't sell. Uh, so the bank carries that. I'm unsure if they have to have valuations, but as I'm, my observation is the banks maintain that land value so that they don't default their whole book. Um, so I wouldn't want to interfere with those processes where I think banks act responsibly. I don't have the view actually that banks, you know, don't work with farming largely. They do. The problem occurs when things go wrong and as we've said, the timeliness. But overall, I think the issue of valuation should be uh, generally, I think we sh the bank is the one risking the money. So I'm OK. We basically, you know what your value is anyway as a farmer. So I'm not arguing strongly it should be ex because if it, there may be an unintended consequence, Commissioner, of forcing it out into the open, in which case the bank would need to withdraw money. And I think that's, that's a risk. That's all. Um, Mr McMahon, um, do you want to comment on that? Do you see banks maintaining the land value in those difficult times or do you have a different experience? In, in respect of maintaining land values or the... Yes, saying and, and refraining. I think what Mr Wheatcroft is saying that the bank is refraining from getting a valuation in those periods. Um, the is, that, did I, is that what I understood correctly, Mr Wheatcroft? I wouldn't want to be responsible for saying the bank should get new valuations at those moments. Uh, I find one of the problems with the um, with talking about the valuations, and um, if if the problem has arisen because of a collapse in commodity, uh, the properties are likely to, to come down in value because of because of the commodity collapse, and um, that's not going to be a long-term thing that it will turn around when the, when the industry uh, recovers and, and that is we've seen it in the sugar industry in Queensland, we've seen it in the beef industry and now there's record prices for everything and the interesting thing with the beef, when the beef industry uh, picked up, the values across the board picked up and um, the when, if, if banks are tightening their lending making it more difficult for people to sell in that because other people can't buy, that in turn uh, devalues the area and um, the whole property market becomes deflated. And the, uh, there is no, no one wins in those circumstances because if the farmers are being forced to sell, often they can't sell and they take years to sell and we've 
if we it been through mediation, we've got to go back and get um, extensions on on the deeds and that and that type of thing, uh, because the people just cannot uh, sell. And so, the bank is partly responsible for that whole valuation decline because there's so many forced sales coming on at the same time, uh, and relying upon valuations is. Uh, I think it should be more important as to the capacity of the business to manage the debt when values are, uh, are low, rather than what the, the values uh, are at that particular time. Mr Day, does ASIC have a position on whether banks ought to provide copies of property valuations paid for by the borrower to the borrower? A ASIC thinks they should. I mean, we, I think I note that the, the Code of Banking Practice now says the banks will do that, and I think they should do that. Um, but my personal view is I really question the point of valuations, generally speaking, anyway. Um, they're, they're only a snapshot at a point of time. As Mr McMahon says, they're impacted by so many different things. You really have to question the value of them. And that doesn't matter if it's in the hands of the borrower or the hands of the lender. A borrower will always have a very um, sunny side up view of what the property is worth and its, and its prospects going forward. A, a, a lender will change its view depending on a whole range of other circumstances, depending on what it is. Um, in fact, you know, the, the arguments that I've seen caused just by a disagreement about the valuation and the valuer, the valuer's experience, um, knowledge of the market, all of those, you, you, you re, it nearly creates a fight for no reason other than just there's a document. And I, I just really personally question the value of valuations in the first place. In that, uh when the beef industry was really in difficult circumstances, particularly in, in North Queensland, uh, valuers were finding very, very difficult to get to do a proper valuation in any event because of the uh, there was no historic sales around that would be relevant. Uh, and so, at mediation, a lot of the times the banks would uh, say, "Look, we don't really want to rely upon the valuations because they're a historical snapshot. What does agents say they could get for these properties?" And quite often the agents would come back and say they're unsaleable uh, in that current market. And, and that's where I'm talking about the patience is needed by everyone, I suppose, uh, but certainly by the bank to, to see that forcing people out in those sorts of environments is just creating a disaster for everyone, including other bank customers, because they all seem to, will be falling into that same category if, they, if they're using LVR type um, Loan structures and <coughs> so a, a decreased valuation um, can result in a breach of an LVR it can, covenant yes. on the loan. Uh, are non-monetary defaults, whether caused by a valuation or, or caused by something else, a, a common issue in farming disputes in your experience? They can be. But, um, I, I think the major one would be that uh, <coughs> that the the existing facilities are out of order and the bank has decided that they would like it paid back or they, wanted, they want more. A lot of the facilities give the banks the, the discretionary powers to, to ask for money back. And in circumstances where it's difficult, it's almost impossible. Um, the uh, 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 adverse material uh, change of use and that type of thing, it certainly was a, an issue with the dairying industry years ago. Um, the, uh, some, there's been farmers who haven't uh, asked, their, their facilities are in order, but the bank is still proceeding with mediation and wanting them to exit, wanting to end the relationship. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be even breach. Uh, they can just have the decision that uh, we no longer will renew that facility. And because the overdrafts can be re reviewed annually, that gives them the option to do so. We've often seen where the loan facilities might have a function in it where the, the bank has got a discretion to ask for a, ca a large capital payment back and um, there's no possibility of, of that being able to be done without the sale of farm. Uh, we've even seen where farms ha farmers have gone and asked for loans to purchase a, a new property. Um, the bank says yes, so we'll fund that when the, uh, the loan documents arrive, it says we'll fund you to purchase this property but part of the condition is you've got to sell another property. Uh, and that hadn't been discussed with the with the farmer. The farmer had already committed themselves to the contract because they were basically told their finance would be approved. Um, so there, there are all sorts of um, 
ways in which the uh, facilities can be clawed back. And uh, Mr Wheatcroft, in Western Australia, uh, do you see instances of non-monetary defaults being relied on by the banks? I initially thought the answer was no, but that, and it's not a general practice, but landmark case is a case in point where they landmark valued their, they used to include machinery and, and livestock in their valuations. When it went to ANZ, ANZ excluded them. And so almost certainly most of those loans were in default. They certainly weren't, they, they weren't done in a way that ANZ did them, which I think fed into the problem that ANZ had in dealing with them. Um, and we saw people, you have to question people when they take out a loan one year and it's called in within 12 months. Like, to me, that's a trigger that something's going wrong in that situation. And Mr Day, the complaints to ASIC, do they tend to involve non-monetary defaults? Generally, that they involve a monetary default, but the clause or the term that might be relied on might be a non-monetary default. Um, but in the matters we've seen, and again, it's a very small sample over a 10-year period, we've seen monetary default in the majority of those. We've also so seen where the monetary default may have been caused by the borrower having to pay for an independent accountant's report or effectively then a evaluation as well, and that's helped exacerbate the situation and get to that point. But the majority of, far and away, the majority of them are monetary defaults. Commissioner, I see the time. I have a couple of topics left to deal with with the panel, but this might be an appropriate time for yes. a break. Yes, 2 p.m. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll adjourn until 2 p.m. ask some questions now about farm debt mediation. Mr McMahon, you participated in many farm debt mediations. Uh, could you please comment on the process generally uh, and whether you think it's useful? Yes, I have um, participated in many farm debt mediations. The process, when it was under the Queensland Farm Finance Strategy, the, uh, the philosophy behind the strategy was early intervention and to negotiate, trying to negotiate with, with the, uh, the bank and the farmer. And if they entered into an agreement, then if there was default under that agreement, then the farm debt mediation would be offered. That was the idea and principle. Um, the uh, mediation was to be offered before enforcement action was taken, which was either going to court, appointing receivers, taking possession of the property. The, um, Prior to that, there was uh, it was simply nothing that would, could prevent a bank after it issued its uh, notice of demand from taking possession. So the mediation process um, has been very, very important. The, um, the, the, I suppose the difficulty is with it is that there is a significant power imbalance. And the, um, when you're going to mediation, uh, the obtaining the information from the bank is, is extremely uh, difficult, uh, particularly relevant information if you have concerns about the veracity of the loan or that certain actions of, that the bank may have taken during that are, that are concerning to you. Often that information just uh, doesn't become available. The, um, under the old strategy, there was no overarching body that uh, you could go to and, and make a complaint and uh, or there was no way of even enforcing any um, bank to go to mediation. There was a, there was a bank that uh, simply uh, refused to mediate for a while there. The, um, so the, the process did have its flaws, but the early intervention part of the, the process was very good. With the introduction of the, uh, the new Act in 2017, the, there has been a more strident uh, approach to the mediation. It certainly is much more um, th there are steps that have got to be taken. There, there is provisions in, in the Act for the bank to provide certain documentation, probably not as much as we'd like to have. Uh, in fact, when, when the bank does provide all the information and all of the information is there for the client to see, if, if it's not in favour of the client, at least the client can see that, that, um, that the bank hasn't been uh, doing uh, 
the uh, terrible things that the, that the farmer thought. Uh, however, on the occasions when there are concerns and the bank does provide that material, it's, it, address, it enables all the parties to negotiate on far uh, more equal footing. And so that power imbalance is, is reduced. With the new Act, the, um, there is Q Rider, Queensland Industry Rural Development Authority. Uh, it's the authority that looks after the, uh, the administration of the Act. Um, and the Act does provide that the, the uh, all mortgagees, so it just doesn't, uh, Queensland Farm Finance Strategy was really only banks that decided to sign up to the strategy. Whereas this, it's all mortgagees. It doesn't matter whether you are a credit union or a private lender or a major bank. Um, you're all captured by it. And there are provisions if, if you don't mediate, then uh, the Act does provide for uh, penalties for that. So um, the, uh, but the mediation, it also provides that parties must act in good faith. And the, um, the process, if it's operated correctly, it, it's, uh, it's a very good process, certainly much better than what was available before. Um, I can say that some people feel that they are under duress to reach an agreement and the reality is that if they don't reach an agreement but that the bank has acted in good faith, then the bank can apply, the mediator signs off and says the, the, there was a satisfactory mediation then that form goes to Curida and Curida issues a show cause notice to the farmer and says, is there any reason why I shouldn't issue an enforcement notice um, so as the bank can, can take enforcement action? So um, clients feel that they must get an outcome. Um, there's no obligation on them to reach an outcome, but the reality is uh, they, they've got to take a commercial decision. If they don't get an outcome, their only other option would be to go to court because they can't go to the Financial Ombudsman Service. They, there's no other sort of services around. So the, um, and the fact of um, people going to court is just completely out of the, the question for the vast majority of people that would be under financial stress. Um, I have actually approached, uh, tried to seek um, other organisations, organisations that might fund some of these actions for public interest. Uh, it's difficult to get um, lawyers that have got that, that aren't conflicted out, that have got experience in, in the banking industry, that aren't conflicted out with acting for clients in these matters. So, um, in the absence of that, and I, I've only, I don't, I've never had a client that's been able to gain any uh, traction that way. The uh, the clients have to make the commercial decision: will I enter into an agreement, or um, the, res the, the worst, uh, the result is that if they don't enter into agreement, they run the, the risk of the bank taking enforcement action. Mr Wheatcroft, Western Australia doesn't have compulsory farm debt mediation, uh, but you participated in the voluntary scheme within Western Australia, is that right? That's correct. And what are your views about the effectiveness of that voluntary scheme? The most effective aspect of it is, is that it's early. It doesn't wait for the um, letter of demand. <clears throat> Pardon me. So it can, either party can bring it um, with the agreement of the other party to debt mediation early on. It also um, enables the people who run a small business development corporation have previously run small business debt mediation and they realise the importance of having someone assist the farmer going through their documentation and actually understanding their position and they immediately involve us at the Royal Financial Counselling Service. And as I have noted, 90-odd percent of the cases are solved before it actually gets to formal mediation because it, it yes, engages people early and it starts the conversation and restarts the conversation. And in your view, why is it important to engage people early? I think that notion we described earlier of people toughing it out, taking a position and trying to defend it, um, often leads to a lack of communication with the bank. And the bank... From the farmer's point of view, the bank sends a lot of letters of which none of them really seem to matter. It's at, that's incorrect because the bank is following a legal process that, that has an end point. But I think very often the bank's views are somewhat dismissed by the farmers because it's not part of, behaviourally, they've had letters that don't matter in a sense. 
So it restarts the conversation and lets them hear the bank's point of view. Mr Day, does ASIC have any views on whether farm debt mediation is a process that should be applied in all farm finance disputes? I mean, ASIC supports external dispute resolution at all times in these types of matters. Um, we can see from farm debt mediation it has a, a, a number of strengths. Um, it seems to be a more personal, face-to-face -face, um, uh, process, and that obviously is beneficial. Um, obviously, the farmers want to be listened to and, and be dealing with people who understand farming issues, so that seems to be a, a big benefit. Also, as Mr Wheatcroft said, that this ability to um, call that type of mediation or, if you like, the precursor to the mediation on earlier is obviously advantageous. So rather than it being a, you know, a dire circumstance and at the end of the process, having it earlier is obviously a, a good thing. What we've also seen, what we have seen, though, is that the, the interrelationship or the interaction between farm debt mediation and um, FOS, the, the financial ombudsman scheme, which the, the big banks all are a member of, um, there is a problem sometimes between the interaction of those two. So if the certificate for denoting the end or signalling the end of and completion of the mediation, the farm debt mediation, has been issued, we have seen cases where FOS will not look at the matter at all. Uh, we think that's a shame because Mediation, farm debt mediation is just that, it is just mediation. There is no arbitration that follows as, as, as part of that process, as part of that scheme. Um, whereas obviously FOS has a mediation component, um, albeit its mediation component by and large is on the telephone, which we think for farming circumstances is probably less than you know, advantageous in that. And, and farm debt mediation, as I said before, has advantages in that respect. But it, if in, the, in circumstances where the mediation is not successful, and the parties can't come to an agreement, the matter can move then to arbitration in the hands of FOLS as the Ombudsman scheme. And that has real benefit. And we have seen instances where um, farmers, and, and again, this may be the only time, and hopefully the only time in their life they have are involved in these types of issues, and they don't understand that and don't understand how those two things don't interrelate properly. And again, one is either a voluntary scheme or a state prescribed scheme. FOS is obviously in relation to licences at a federal level and they don't actually refer to each other or interrelate in a, in a way that's advantageous to the borrower. Mr. One Wheatcroft. more point. One of the reasons it works is because it brings the level of person into the room that can make decisions. So the banks almost, mm. I think they have the person handling it plus someone to review what they're doing and that level allows a greater decision making capability. The advantage of mediation is also that the farmer has some control over what's happening and is able to negotiate in that outcome uh, where they both will have some compromises to reach an agreement and it's far better for the farmer to be uh, participating in the process than sitting on the sidelines and, uh, and, and you know, they can be uh, uh, determining what the future is going to be. In their, it's in their hands as well. You've been next to your statement, Mr McMahon, uh, a table showing the number of farm debt mediations that your unit has participated in over the last 10 years. That's at RCD 00240019021. That will be on the screen Oh, sorry, now. yes, yeah. Can you explain this table? Does this relate to um, formal farm debt mediations or to instances where the farm debt mediation scheme is invoked that might resolve prior to a formal mediation? The, these would be the uh, farm debt mediations that have actually taken place. Uh, that doesn't include the numbers of mediated agreements. Oh, sorry, of, of agreements outside of mediation. Yes, I see. Yeah. So we see there that from 2008 through to 2018, your organisation has been involved in 224 farm That's debt correct. mediations yeah. uh, and the entity uh, that you've dealt with most in farm debt mediations is ANZ, 60 of the 224. That's correct. Followed by NAB at 53 of the 224. Mm -hmm. uh, and the largest numbers of farm debt mediations appear to have been in 2014 when your organisation was involved in 63 farm debt mediations. Are you able to offer any explanation for that spike in farm debt mediations in that year? 
when clients are offered mediation, often the events have happened several years before. Yes. And it takes a number of years for them to filter through the system before they're coming into farm debt mediation uh, procedures. And if you look back, 2010 is when there was the, um, the Millennium Drought was, was broken, there was the, the floods. 2011, we had the um, live export ban. And then I'm sure 2013, we had the significant floods again. There was, um, and, and funnily enough, the floods, the flooding events were so much more catastrophic to a lot of, a lot of businesses than the drought. The drought sort of lingered on, and, and uh, whereas the, the flooding events or cyclones and whatever really uh, just came in and smashed um, uh, crops and, and livelihoods. Um, so I think that the, the spike would have been as a result of um, when the, after the rain, after all those years of drought, properties were, by the, a lot of times, were unsaleable. After the, the rain, when they'd be able to grass up and whatever, I think banks took the opportunity to say, well, these, these properties uh, were marketable again. And uh, um, unfortunately, during some of these periods, clients found it almost impossible to sell some of the properties. And what, if anything, should we make of the representation of the ANZ figures here? So I mentioned already that they had the highest number of participation in the farm debt mediations. That applies in that year, 2014, as well, with 23 of the 63 farm debt mediations in 2014. Yes, well, some of those ones that are under the name, the banner of ANZ, would have been ones that would have been previously a landmark file that had been transitioned over to ANZ. Yes. Um, and others would have, would have been just the uh, ANZ customers, but I haven't done a um, analysis of that. It would, it would take some time to to go through that. Yes. Uh, and farm, dedia, farm debt mediations can result in a deed of forbearance being entered into between the farmer and the bank. Yes, generally speaking, they do. Yes. And can you explain what that is, what a deed of forbearance is? Well, it's an agreement between the parties that um, during a, a, whatever the negotiated period is, the, the bank will forbear from taking any enforcement action. Uh, and the, the parties will agree to whether it's sell, refinance, sell part of the property and refinance or sell everything. Um, there's generally given time frames to, to fulfil these particular functions. And at the end of the day, if they haven't fulfilled them by, that, by the um, expiry date, then um, it's up to the parties to whether they uh, can extend it. The banks, it's really up to the bank whether they're prepared to agree to extend the facility or to, um, or the bank will take possession. Um, and in your experience, to what extent do farmers um, have a say in the terms of the deed of forbearance? The, the farmers aren't told they must sign. It's, it's, <coughs> it ultimately is their, um, their decision as to whether to sign or not. But the time frames, um, generally speaking, the farmers are wanting more time frames than the bank's prepared to give. And there's a lot of argy-bargy negotiating in relation to those things. If you have a look at valuations, um, the valuations will often say what the estimated market, uh, marketing, normal marketing period for type of property. And, and uh, for example, the further west you go, the, the longer the marketing period will be because by the very nature, there'll be fewer and fewer buyers the further west, um, for both having the, the, the financial backing to be able to purchase them and also the capacity to run properties out there. So uh, each area um, has a different marketing period and the, um, often the, the banks aren't prepared to consider that length, length of time for the forbearance period. And it's, it's an extremely stressful period for the farmer because they're under a uh, stress to sell something which isn't the normal marketing period for the property and um, they often have to take a, uh, uh, a reduced sale price in order to sell if they can. But 
but the um, the tragedy of it all was when when there were significant um, uh, mediations and properties in forced sale environment, uh, very few of them were selling, and uh, well, there was a lot of uh, extensions had to happen, and this has. Um, um, as property prices improved, it's enabled the some of them, most of them, to to have um, sold. Um, that, that, sorry, that one of the reasons, one of the things that we did mention about in uh, the submissions was that the um, the difficulty in people getting a refinance in in the circumstances if they're under either a deed of forbearance, asset management, uh, if any of their facilities are out of order. Most banks, well, in fact, what we've been told by finance brokers and the like is banks don't want, to, don't want to look at another bank's problem. So unless the bank and the farmer can negotiate to get the facilities back in order by renewing or, or restructuring the facilities, even during the forbearance period, to, so as the facility the, is, is trading within their limits, if there is that option available, there is a possibility of a refinance, or if a property part of the property is sold, then then refinance the balanced debt. Um, so there is that particular problem that you have to consider when you're looking at uh, negotiating outcomes. The other thing is, if if a bank is prepared to do a debt write down, the other banks won't look at them, um, and uh, some of there there may be one or two of the, not the big banks, the others that may look at a refinance in those sorts of uh, circumstances. This is all information coming to me by finance brokers and clients and accountants and uh, Royal Financial Counselors. And the, um, if the, um, if a bank says, look, we're prepared to take a hit to get out, then trying to refinance that debt to another institution is very difficult, even if there's full capacity of the business to manage that written down debt. So there, there is a, 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 a um, place in the finance world that's really uh, needs to be looked at. If, if banks are prepared to give debt write downs, then someone needs to take them on. Whereas before the GFC, that was quite a common um, occurrence that uh, when we were negotiating, and, and frankly, before 2008, we did very few mediations. Um, most outcomes were negotiated. And there was a lot of debt write down. Other banks would go and take them on. That wasn't an issue. But uh, since GFC, it's been uh, a major problem. Is that answering? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wheatcroft, can I ask you um, if you could comment on the first, on the question I asked, and any other part of Mr. McMahon's answer then? Uh, the question being the extent to which farmers have a say in the terms of a deed of forbearance. So not suggesting anything that said wasn't correct, but in addition to that, um, anecdotally, when you're offered a deed of forbearance, the bank is saying, we could take your property, but we're going to put on hold that if you do a certain number of things. So farmers really need to sign it if they want to continue farming. It's a very simple decision for them. I have seen it where they've taken those de the um, deed of forbearance is off to a lawyer and paid $10,000 to get back a complicated set of explanations. But of course, it doesn't simplify it for a farmer because it's in legal terms anyway. And deeds of forbearance actually just reinstate the bank has the right to do everything that it is already enabled to do under the loan agreement. So in one sense, they're good for the farmer because they allow the debt to be put on hold, or not the debt on hold, actually. They simply allow the, the bank is prepared to finance them for a period of time while that sits, and they're holding forbearance their action. In WA, it almost always is part of an inevitable path to people leaving. But it can be, and we have seen the bank write off money and other banks take them on in WA. I think it relates back to what I said about the structure of banks and who's trying to build their book at any time and who's trying to reduce it. Um, but as such, deeds of forbearance for farmers, really, they give them, the, they're just the offer. Do you want to continue or not? That's how they see them. And I was going to say that one of, one of the other issues that needs to be considered is that um, deeds of forbearance shouldn't be used for the bank to improve its position. It's already got uh, significant now all of the, the information that's in the uh, in the contract itself. Um, so 
when they're improving their position by um, insisting upon additional material being put in there, I think is grossly unfair. But the um, often it's, it's not even a data forbearance in that it might it could be just a very very short agreement. But Mr. Wheatcroft, uh, Mr. Day before referred to the interaction between farm debt mediation and FOS. Uh, in your view, is FOS an effective body for the determination of disputes between farmers and banks? Largely, where it fits, it is. But FOS has limited scope and the limited panel of ability to reimburse for, for the farmer to receive compensation. But it is, we like it because it enables people with no resources, no money, to actually have, in a sense, someone look at their situation. So we strongly support it. And Mr McMahon, what do you have to say about the um, effectiveness of FODs? Our service doesn't directly become involved with the well, hasn't to this date been directly involved with FOS um, for very reasons that the uh, I, if the, the clients have been to mediation, they don't, uh, they won't look at it. Um, the uh, and the jurisdiction is is quite limited. Most farmers just wouldn't qualify for it. Um, the limited number of matters that uh, where clients have gone through other uh, services, um, they have commented that they would. Not sure whether FOS understood the nuances of of rural lending and and uh, uh, rural businesses. Uh, it's totally different to selling a uh, a house in town. Um, you know, there's all sorts of different issues that need to be considered when you're marketing a rural property, uh, time frames, um, and also about the um, the even if with cash flows, understanding that a cash flow may not necessarily reflect the business that they're lending into. And uh, having that sort of information, that knowledge, would be important. But I, I certainly, I think, from if, we're, if clients aren't satisfied with the outcome at mediation, as, uh, having them, uh, an option for them to go somewhere else, I think is, is absolutely Necessary, it would give um, both parties an incentive to get a to get a resolution. Uh, Mr. Day, in your role and in um, the review that your team's done of the complaints that have come in from farmers, have you discerned any change in the way banks deal with farmers in default uh, in recent years? Um, you can see certainly the number of matters that are coming to us are, are, are smaller in recent years, and that reflected in the type of um, material in Mr McMahon's exhibit that you, you displayed before. Um, in terms of change of approach, change of behaviour, there does seem to be a, a, a slight in tendency, increased tendency to want to negotiate and, and work that through. But have I seen that as a change in stance in terms of um, the haste at which receivers are appointed or um, other, other options are you know, considered by the banks? I, I think the answer to that would be no. Mr Wheatcroft, have you observed a change in recent years? Oh, absolutely, regarding a couple of the, the landmark cases, mm -hmm. ANZ have actually resolved virtually all of the difficulty, all of the continuing difficulties with farmers that are still operating. The, the ones that have already um, exited the industries, that I presume they're not resolved properly. But um, yes, certainly they changed. In fact, I'd say, um, the notion that there might have been going to be a Royal Commission has actually influenced the banks to think that they might sort this, to pay some more attention to it from a higher level, yes. And Mr McMahon? Yeah, look, there's been a, certainly a great uh, change and uh, Mr Wheatcroft mentioned ANZ. ANZ uh, implemented a uh, moratorium, I think it was 2015. Uh, any property that was in a drought declared area, they didn't take any enforcement action. Uh, they extended that for 12 months, um, and uh, and also they they have supported customers, whereas in the past they may not have done so. They've certainly been far more cooperative and conciliatory with with customers and negotiating outcomes um, than uh, than have been the case before. Can I finish by asking one question that I'd like each of you to address? Perhaps starting with you, Mr. Day. 
uh, if you could fix one thing in relation to agricultural finance and the problems that we've been discussing, what would it be? I think it's the, the matter I raised before. Um, I think the, the position of farm debt mediation is great, you know, compared to the, the approach FOS has taken to mediation in terms of it is face to face, it does involve people who understand farming, and I think that's been good. Um, I think the movement from FOS to AFCA is 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 welcome in terms of the increased jurisdiction and a de and a defined set of terms around prime lenders to primary producers. Um, but I would like to think that that interaction and interrelationship between farm debt mediation and um, the uh, the ability to access arbitration through Africa could be you know sorted out. But to a point that it gives you, if you like, a best of breed response. I wouldn't like to see you have a national scheme that, if you like, might be administered in the same way FOS has done mediation to date. I think taking the benefits of the state systems that exist, whether they be voluntary or compulsory, so that there is face-to-face -face mediations involving farmers um, and people with experience involved as those mediators, I think, would be a welcome change. But I th So I think the interaction between the, the two systems, if you like, or schemes, I think sh there should be some work done to improve the circumstance. Because both of them will have benefits, but I think if they're working well together, then it could be an increased set of benefits. Mr Wheatcroft? Um, I would say that in WA, most businesses are profitable. Overall, the plan farm bank benchmarks that I've tended to show that. I calculated the amount of destroyed value in the, in the clients we deal with over the period they have from when they're in difficulty to when they exit. And so every billion dollars of value gets destroyed during that period. And that's because there's something about the time it takes and the way it's done. I would, um, I would like the Commission to examine whether or not the appointment of receivers achieves what the bank thinks it does. I, I suspect, actually, the banks don't realise, haven't really looked at it, from the, and it certainly doesn't support a client. I know of no case where it's worked. So if I could have put up an issue, it would be about how, the, how receivers are used. If the Commission can't look at receivers themselves, that's fine, but let's look at how they're used and whether the banks actually intend them to do something that's fair. It was said earlier, um, outside of this, that um, those receivers work on behalf of the clients. And I had to admit that I had never come across that notion. It is outside my experience that that is actually how they operate. So I suggest that perhaps there's a, a misconception. Well, I just put it up as an issue to be looked at. Thank you. Mr McMahon? I, I'm, I keep on going back to what clients keep on telling me about the unfairness of facilities being able to be, um, at the bank's discretion, changed. Um, and, and they have great difficulty in, 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 well, everyone would have great difficulty if they're at the end of, if they're the ones that are uh, the subject of those changes, where one side can unilaterally change the conditions in the, in the agreement. And if those facilities, uh, if it's unfair, in the, as the public would see it, then it would be, if this was a, you know, a special little thing to be able to have, and I don't know how, how we could uh, ever arrive at this, but to have a, some ability for the fairness and the reasonableness of the actions to be considered. Legally, they can do under their documentation, under their loan contracts, but um, you know, with the change, it'd have to be requiring a change of <coughs> philosophy within the banks, but also probably uh, law, that um, that a fairness and a reasonableness be taken into account in relation to uh, bank action. And uh, I think clients would be far more comfortable with uh, outcomes if they knew what, that it was fair. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Any party having leave to appear, seek leave to ask questions of any of these gentlemen. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your attendance and for your evidence. Uh, it's very thought-provoking. And uh, you may step down. You're excused. Thank you. The Commission give us a few minutes to arrange for the next witness. Uh, if I come back, what, 20 to 3? Thank you, Commissioner. Yes.